Podcasts. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Cleopatra Philopater died more than 2,000 years ago, and yet stop any person in the street today and ask them who she was, and they'll know. At least they'll know her name. That name has been attached over the years to soaps and bath bombs, to slot machines and casinos, even to a popular brand of cigarettes. As an asteroid, 216 Cleopatra, the Egyptian queen has even made it to the stars. Harold Bloom once called her the world's first celebrity. And while she may not be the first, she's certainly one of the most enduring. What is it about Cleopatra that has captured our imaginations for not just decades, but millennia? Why do we remember her as well as we do? She just leaps off the page. I think that that is something that really impressed me reading about her. The way that she's so vivid, she has so much agency. She's always doing things that are so dramatic. She's got such an eye for spectacle and everything that she does. And I think she's really sees the imaginations of so many people all through the centuries who read about her. And yet, for such an enduringly famous woman, her legacy has come down to us as more of a caricature than anything else. What we remember about her tends to be defined as follows. She was a lavish, wanton queen who made two famous Roman men her conquests. She ruled Egypt for a time, well, mostly using her sexual wiles, and then she fell. Where in there is the deft political leader who minted coins and savvily managed the Egyptian economy? Where is the fierce mother and protector of her nation? Where is the linguistic genius and level-headed scholar? In my quest to understand the evolution of her twisty, turning legacy, how we remember her, and perhaps how we should remember her better, I turn to some of my favorite history podcasters and teachers who have covered her themselves. I'm Dr. Rhiannon Evans. I'm the Associate Professor of Classics and Ancient History at La Trobe University, and I'm the, the main guest on the podcast Emperors of Rome. I'm Jenny Williamson. And I'm Jen McManamy. And we are from Ancient History Fangirl. Hey guys, this is Katie from Queen's Podcast. On our show, me and my friend Nathan get together, pair cocktails with exciting women in history, and have a blast. Hello, this is Ann Foster from the Vulgar History Podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Rad. And I am Dr. G. And together we host a podcast called The Partial Historians. In this special epilogue to our Cleopatra series, we're going to try and understand the shape Cleopatra's image has taken over the centuries. Why do we remember her the way we do, and perhaps how we should remember her differently? Grab your diadem. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. To my newest patrons, Stephanie and Lizzie, a handful of my pirate queens, Wendy, Stephanie, Sean, Samantha, Morgan, Mikkel, Marie Claire, Lydia, Louise, and Lauren O, and a clutch of my lady presidents, Wendy N, Veronica, Townsend, another Stephanie, Sarah S, another Sarah S, Sasha. Paul, Pamela, and Ninkiru, and to the Imperators and Augustas who give me more each month than I ask for, Jackie C, Dylan, Lizzie E, Karen C, Alexis, Jessica S, Avery, and Lee. Becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month really helps me keep the show going, plus it gives you access to exclusive bonus episodes interviews, sneak peeks, and more. Right now, you'll find a special bonus on one of Cleopatra's most interesting forebears, Arsinoe II, and another that includes the full interviews with all of my special guests. To find out more, just go to my website. And now, back to Cleopatra. To make sense of her legacy and the shape it's taken, we have to start in the ancient world, just after her death. Imagine Octavian sitting at his desk, quill in hand, and writing out the following recipe. 
Half a cup of male Roman writers with agendas. Three dashes of lost documents and a lack of primary sources. Two heaping tablespoons of an emperor who doesn't like powerful women. Bake for a few generations. Enjoy. We know that the ancient world had other queens and infamous women. Olympias, Agrippina, Boudica, the list goes on. There were also some rather impressive women operating in the Roman Empire. And while we know some things about them, there are often footnotes in ancient writers' stories about other people, namely famous men. Cleopatra stands out for being one of the main players in their dramas, not written about for her own sake, perhaps, but a central piece of the narrative about the period in which she lived. Why, of all these women, is Cleopatra the one we see blown up to such epic proportions? One of the reasons we remember Cleopatra so vividly and she's so popular in our collective consciousness is, is chance, basically. We have a lot of written sources about her, or rather about the Roman men she was involved with. And unfortunately, we've, we've lost many sources, or some ancient women who were really interesting haven't been written about very much. Another reason she features so prominently in ancient sources is because she lived during a really momentous time, in which some pretty big changes were happening in the Mediterranean. And she was part of those big shifts. She was the last pharaoh of Egypt. Not just the end of a dynasty, but of a mighty, incredibly long-lived empire. Here's Dr. G. The way that, it, uh, that Egyptian rule and sole rule of Egypt sort of slides to an end uh, this is an incredible story. And so you've got a savvy politician Absolutely. coming out of Egypt, mixed up with the best of the late Republican bunch that we've got. And it's a, it's a <laughs> recipe for a legacy that's really hard for other women, other ancient women figures to compete with in terms of a of a, like, a legacy. And of course, there's the fact that Cleopatra got all tangled up in one of the most significant and tumultuous periods in Rome's history. She became very involved with two of its most famous game-changing men. And even if Octavian despised her, she also played a big part in his origin story about how he became Rome's first emperor. As such, ancient historians couldn't just ignore her. But unfortunately for Cleopatra, the few ancient writers who give us her story aren't doing it to flatter her or highlight her many accomplishments. And they can do this without issue because Cleo ultimately lost the war. Part of the reason she's remembered is that the kind of image that we've got of her is, has been really manipulated by the surviving sources because she, she was the loser in the end in, in the war against Augustus, Octavian as he was at the time. So she's, she comes out on the losing side and that means that she's in a way vulnerable to the way that people want to represent her at that time and ever since. Now add in the fact that these accounts are all we really have left of Cleopatra. There's almost nothing left of her in Egypt written out in her own words. She faces the same challenge that just about every female figure in history has suffered from up until a certain point, which is the lack of having their own voice on the record. Her Alexandria was mostly destroyed, most of its great monuments eroded, many of her physical achievements sunk down into the sea. And so she becomes a shadowed, sultry outline that male writers can fill in at their pleasure. Here's Anne. The thing is that nobody has found yet any Egyptian or Greek writing surviving from Cleopatra's lifetime. So it's not just a history written by the victors scenario, but it's also slanderous history written by the misogynist haters who are also the victors sort of situation. So we remember her the way we do because that is how the only surviving records, most of the surviving records write about her. Things get more complicated when that victor also happens to be Octavian, who later becomes Augustus, first emperor of Rome. He uses Cleopatra as a way to get rid of his rival Mark Antony. He needed Antony to seem like a drunken, besotted puppet, and for Cleo to play the part of the manipulative, dangerous seductress. That image-making didn't stop after she died. There is this real dual uh, narrative going on and a high tension uh, that we see in the way that Cleopatra is betrayed, because on the one hand, she has to cop a sort of a highly negative political invective for her connection with Antony that's coming from Octavian. But at the same time, she yeah. can't be too great, because if she is, then 
Octavian's victory doesn't mean that much or there's problems for him in terms of how he positions his victory over her if she's solely yeah. this sort of uh, malevolent, um, destructive figure. She has to be a worthy opponent on some level. Uh, the Roman narrative dictates Absolutely. that as well. And then, three years after Cleo dies, Octavian manages what once seemed like the impossible. He becomes Rome's very first official emperor. The Republic is dead. We're now at the dawn of the Roman Empire. Somehow, the man now known as Augustus Caesar gets this monarch hating land to accept him as their more or less absolute ruler. How does he do it? Very carefully. And manipulating Cleo's image to suit his purposes is definitely a key part of his business plan. As part of his slide into the power seat, he embarks on a kind of family values campaign, becoming the moral whipcracker who will bring the increasingly lax ways of his subjects up to scratch. And while making sure to play down his absolute power, he turns up the volume on his version of Cleopatra. In death, she becomes his own personal pin the tail on the donkey. He gets to put deviousness, decadence, and moral corruption all over her. By blowing up all the ways in which she was wanton, power-hungry, and exotic, and therefore bad, he gets to look good by comparison. And, as Jen tells us, he gets to grapple with a thing he doesn't like or understand, an independent and capable female ruler. A lot of the reasons why he demonized her is because once he took power, I think women like Cleopatra and also Fulvia, who's another woman from around this time period, terrified. Augustus. I don't think he knew what the hell to do with a strong woman. Because what we see when Augustus comes to power, and a lot of the stuff we're finding out about Cleopatra is being written during this time or slightly after with this lens on it, is that women who have power, women who have agency, they are awful, they are mannish, they are not to be trusted. Writers like Plutarch, being products of their time, also had trouble grappling with Cleopatra as ruler. Ancient men in the West were both fascinated and confused by her. And so they wrote to try and understand her in relation to themselves. The men who wrote these things couldn't wrap their head around the idea, like the concept that a woman could be smart and savvy and charismatic and a good leader. Her actions were important and notable enough that they had to be written about somehow, just to explain what went down with Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and Augustus. But the way that they did it is they twisted it around to try and make her power move seem less impressive. Because if she was just this, like, sexy witch who used magic to make fen men fall in love with her, or just she was just so sexy that people threw themselves at her feet, that makes what she accomplished seem less impressive somehow. Guys like Cicero, who actually met her, talk about hating her. But, as Dr. G says... This is more to do with the way that she's engaging and causing problems for the way that Rome does its own politics. And part of the reason why she might have stood out for our consciousness is because of the way that Romans have tried to build a particular legacy and narrative for understanding her in terms of themselves. Most are writing about her long after she lived in the shadow of the Augustan era. They have every reason to make her into someone we might love to hate. Plutarch is our main source for Cleo's story, and he's writing it a hundred years after her death. And he only talks about her so much because he's writing his Life of Antony, in which he uses her to explain away what's perceived as Mark's perplexing failings. Cleopatra is used to tell readers a cautionary tale about what happens to great men who let themselves be seduced by power, and especially by a powerful woman. So contemporary writers depicting her as this extravagant, drunken, sexually lax figure, uh, really playing into the Augustan discourse about queens, about the East, and indeed about Antony, who's the other loser in that war, means that we're left with this version of her that she couldn't control, which is a shame because she seems to have been quite good at controlling her image while she was alive. Cassius Dio, Josephus, poets like Horace. They all manipulate her image for their own narrative purposes. Pliny doesn't relate that whole thing about her drinking a pearl because it makes a good story, although, of course, it does. It's supposed to be a moral tale to show readers how shameful Cleopatra really was. As Katie and Nathan put it, The question is, why do we remember her the way we do? Because misogyny. I, because misogyny is the short answer. But I think the the longer answer is, is because she took the hearts of these two very powerful Roman rulers 
And until you put a, you know, like the lens on it that people use now, people just thought, um, well, she wouldn't have able, been able to do that if she wasn't beautiful. And you, it's just discounting women that can also be brilliant without being beautiful. So I think um, she's remembered for being like this beautiful seductress and conniving. And I'm not saying she wasn't conniving. She was a little bit conniving. But maybe she should also be remembered for being um, smart. At the same time, these ancient writers can't quite play down their awe of her, their clear fascination. And there was a real mythology they built up around her, like Cleopatra was a living goddess on Earth. She was Isis come again into this world. And the Roman people, and particularly like the upper class Romans who were writing about her, they all had strong feels. I mean, many of them were negative, but none of them could actually like as much as they didn't like her. They were all like, she might not be the most beautiful, but damn, she's charismatic. Damn, she knows how to make a scene and an entrance. And she knew how to get what she wanted. And the way they write about her helps blow her up into this larger-than-life figure that's impossible for us to forget. So this is the demonization of Cleopatra, and you see it in a lot of different ancient sources. But there's, of course, also the glamour of Cleopatra, the agency of Cleopatra, the wealth, the sophistication, and the spectacle, which just absolutely leaps off the page no matter who is writing about her. So you get both. The time period really affects how we remember her. The same men who tried to put her down by claiming she was a sorceress or just used sex appeal to get ahead wound up, uh, without meaning to, creating a legend that people have found captivating, clearly, century after century. As we move away from the ancient world and into the Middle Ages and beyond, we see Cleo's legacy become even more exaggerated, though only certain aspects of her seem to shine through. Those aspects take on their own life, becoming the sum of Cleopatra. One, she was exceptionally beautiful. Two, she was exceptionally lavish in her lifestyle. And three, she was an accomplished prostitute. But if there's one thing the writers of Around Her Day tell us, it's that Cleopatra wasn't beautiful. She was charming, well-spoken, and magnetic, but no Helen of Troy. When you look at the ancient sources that knew her and that were more contemporary to her time, they don't say she was beautiful. What they say is that she was smart, she was charismatic, she was a riveting conversationalist, she was a linguistic genius who spoke nine languages. They really respected her for her mind and for her conversation and for her presence. And I think it's so much more interesting to know that she may not have been beautiful, or if she was, that wasn't the main reason that pe she was able to lead people so effectively. It was her magnetism, her charisma, and her intelligence and wit that won people over to her side. It's so much more interesting to think that who she was as a person is why she was so successful, not just because of, um, you know, witchcraft or because she just like had a pretty face or a nice figure or whatever. But that's complicated for writers of the past to grapple with. And make no mistake, her legacy has, by and large, been shaped and polished by men. Most of history has been written by men, in fact, and they traditionally don't know what to do with a powerful female leader. The options seem to be, one, turn her into a corruptive demon, two, take away her power by making it all about her beauty. But then again, why not do both? If you Google Cleopatra's legacy in 2020, at least half the articles you'll find have titles like, Was Cleopatra Beautiful? She is almost entirely defined not by her leadership abilities, but by her sexuality, her physical presence. To boil her success down to her beauty is a way to simplify and explain her influence. It's a means of taking the spotlight off of her accomplishments as a political leader and savvy statesman and focus instead on her body. Because isn't it much less scary to imagine a woman who wins men over with her body than her brain? As Dr. G says, And it's the fear factor that means that she's left with nothing but being beautiful, which may or may not be true, but is a, is a good justification yeah. for why men might lose control. Long after the Augustan period, we still struggled to know what to do with a lady in a position of power. So with that fragility and all the juicy drama the ancient writers gave us, she becomes a canvas that artists in later eras can use to reflect their own ideas, culture, and morality. They pick up what works for them and they run with it. <laughs> Ten
Take Giovanni Boccaccio, who wrote in his 1362 book on famous women. She gained her kingdom through crime. She was truly notable for almost nothing, except her ancestry and her beauty. Rather, she was known throughout the world for her greed, cruelty, and excess. Geoffrey Chaucer takes another tack in his Legend of Cleopatra. By the later Middle Ages, the whole Tales About Ladies thing had become something of its own recognized genre, and Chaucer wanted to talk about women who gave themselves up to love, a kind of amorous martyr. Her love made Antony better, he says, and she was totally fine to give up her life for that love. Anon the vipers her began to sting, and she her death received with good cheer, for love of Antony to her so dear. And then, of course, there's Shakespeare. His famous play, Antony and Cleopatra, was inspired by an English translation of Plutarch's Life of Antony. He does make her a more complex character. In many ways, she's perhaps the most complex female character he will ever write. But he, too, focuses right in on the tragic love story, the amorous drama, the image of an emotional, covetous, jealous Cleopatra. Gone is the cool-headed maneuverer. Gone is the pharaoh who wanted to save her country and her family at all costs. It must be said that women writers also get in on the Cleopatra shame game. They use her as a way to wax lyrical on what happens when a woman gives in to her passions. In 1757, Sarah Fielding reimagines a scene where Cleo and Octavia meet up in the underworld and have a chat about their life choices. Awkward. But now, at the approach of my last hours, I could not avoid reflecting on my past life. She has Cleopatra saying, and found, upon the whole, that the indulgence of my ambition and the cultivating in myself the spirit of pride and vanity had produced far more misery than happiness. How indeed can it be otherwise? Charlotte Bronte, much to this podcaster's shame, has a character in her novel Villette comment on a painting of Cleo, suggesting she looks lazy and scandalous, and calling her an indolent gypsy giantess. Much later, pioneering nurse Florence Nightingale will call her that disgusting Cleopatra. Alas, they too fell for the ugly propaganda that reduced Cleopatra to nothing more than a wanton body. In the Romantic period, we see another strand of her legacy get blown up for inspection, her dark, insatiable sexuality. Her sex life and her cruelty winds like two snakes around each other in her legacy. This is where we see that whole femme fatale thing really start to take wing. Some poets from the period pick up on an anecdote found only once in ancient sources. It comes from the 4th century AD. Note how long this is after Cleo was actually alive. Sextus Aurelius Victor tells us that she was so lustful that she often prostituted herself, and so beautiful that many men bought a night with her at the price of their lives. Alexandra Pushkin, in his work Egyptian Nights, paints a scene in which three aroused and terrified men volunteer to be her lovers, even though they know they'll have to die at the end. What? Although it must be said that Cleo isn't the only ancient woman to get this storyline, several others do as well, all of them women in power. History seems to be really interested in giving Cleopatra a wild sexual history. It started not long after she died. A 1st century AD Roman writer would say that, Ancient writers repeatedly speak of Cleopatra's insatiable libido. But then the Arabic sources about Cleopatra are much more interested in making her a deft leader. In Egypt and its surrounds, she remained a point of pride, a savvy politician who would do anything for her people. They had no special love for the Romans, and so were much more invested in making Cleo the heroine of their histories. Zenobia, the ancient queen of Palmyra, who we'll talk about at length in an upcoming episode, loudly and proudly proclaimed herself a descendant of Cleopatra. John, the bishop of Nicaea, wrote around 690 BCE that, There was none of the kings who preceded her who wrought such achievements as she. Those Arab sources also claimed her as author of many scholarly texts, including ones that include her supposed skin treatments and cures for baldness. But in Western sources, she also picks up an avid interest in things having to do with her lady parts. By the 1500s, we find the Gynecia Cleopatrae, or the Gynecology of Cleopatra. It's one of that era's first and most popular gynecological treatises, and it was supposedly written by our Cleopatra VII. 
It's full of handy recipes for encouraging conception and birth as well as preventing them. In it, she describes a suppository that I always use and my sister Arsinoe tried. Can you imagine Cleo and Arsinoe swapping tips on contraception? Because I… no, just no. There is also a series of letters, completely fabricated by a guy in the 15th century, supposedly between Cleo, Mark Antony, and the Greek doctor Sorinus, who most certainly did not live at the same time. Allegedly found on bronze tablets in Cleopatra's tomb, which we still haven't found, Mark writes Sorinus to plead for help in dealing with his wife's inexhaustible sexual appetites. They detail how Cleo once went to a brothel and slept with 106 men in a single evening, but still wasn't satisfied. Okay. And then there is the story that she invented the vibrator. You'll see this one all over the internet. She ingeniously takes a papyrus box or a hollowed out gourd, fills it with bees, and then puts it against her lady palace. Living dangerously there, Cleo. Bizarrely, it seems like this claim first appeared on the scene as late as the 1990s. Yep, we're inventing stories about Cleo's sex life even now which is pretty rich given how little we know about her sex life. And it seems to me like her roster of lovers was actually quite short. This depicting her as, as this sexually lax character is nonsense as far as we know. We only know of her having children with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. We don't know that she had sex with anybody else during her life. The whole thing about her being this sort of like sex bomb is like, I can't imagine how that would possibly be true. She was married to her young brother for years before she um, began her affair with Julius Caesar, so she probably wasn't very sexually experienced at all when they first met. Imagine that version of Cleopatra, unfurled from her burlap sack in front of Julius Caesar, not pursing her lips and ready to roll in the hay, but young, inexperienced, and quite nervous. That's not an image of our young Egyptian queen that we've ever left much room for. Even scholarly texts, until quite recently, have given Cleopatra a bad rap. Dr. Evans told me about the go-to reference text when she was a student. It was the second edition of the Oxford Classical Dictionary, which came out in 1949. Let's see what it had to say about Cleo. She was always her own law. Almost certainly she never loved any man. Her two love affairs were to gain power, for the keynote of her character was intense ambition. Uh, it talks about her fire, her mysticism. You really can't imagine a reference work talking about any man like this, and indeed, this work doesn't. Over the years, Cleopatra has been featured in all kinds of artwork. From 1540 to 1905, she found her way into five ballets, 45 operas, and 77 plays. One of the places you'll find her most often is in paintings. In these, like in literature that features our Cleo, we see her through the lens of the time and place in which she's being painted, often tinted with the color of misogyny. In the Renaissance period, it becomes in vogue to paint figures from antiquity or mythology, but often she's reimagined to conform to the beauty standards of the day. And so we often find Cleo portrayed as a very pale-skinned, blonde or red-haired beauty, dressed in Western clothes, and pleasantly curved to match the beauty idol of the time. European painters highlighted what they thought their audiences wanted, the beauty, drama, the extravagance, and pageantry. Rich patrons who wanted to commission an erotic piece of art, but one that wouldn't get them into too much social trouble, often asked for one of Cleopatra. Many of these feature the woman in question about to drop a pearl into a goblet of wine. Are these meant to be an homage to the classical world? A socially acceptable way of exuding a bit of sexy? Or are they a subtle expression of power at a time when women didn't have much, wrapped up in classical packaging? Very few of the paintings from the era show you Cleopatra sitting at her desk, commanding an army or holding a child in her arms. Instead, they show her sexiest and most dramatic moments. I defy you to find a painting of her that doesn't include a dangling pearl, a viper, or a nip slip. Sometimes all three. Her complexities and political accomplishments are tucked away behind drunken excess, promiscuity, mystery, and allure. But more than anything else, artists have loved to portray her death. This, too, they often sexualize, showing her at least partially nude, reclining on a bed with a snake held near her breast. 
In many of these, she's dead already, a lifeless, yet somehow disturbingly suggestive doll. Those that show her in the act of the snake bite turn her death into an erotic act. The look in her eyes isn't one of fear or even determination. It's the look of a hollow and heartless creature. Sexy, aloof, wanton, distant. So many of them turn her death into a lavish kind of spectacle, and her into a cold and pitiless woman. This is what happens, they seem to say, when we let power-hungry women rule the world. And this is how we reduce them. Almost ever since Cleopatra's lifetime, there has been a certain amount of Egyptomania floating around in the Western world. But after Napoleon Bonaparte marched through Egypt at the turn of the 19th century, bringing many of its ancient spoils back to Europe, it really took the place by storm. The Victorians loved everything Egyptian, the exotic allure, the glitz, the style. Even the Washington Monument in my hometown of D.C. stands as testament to this enduring fascination. So it's no surprise that in artwork of the period, Cleopatra once again becomes an exotic Eastern queen, pictured with Egyptian jewelry, animal prints, clouds of incense. But these portrayals, for the most part, continue to show only harsh judgment and no sympathy, no true complexity. But in a spectacular 19th century marble statue by Edmonia Lewis, we see Cleopatra's story take on yet another interesting layer of meaning. Edmonia, a black American artist working in Rome, does something rather wild by depicting the moment of Cleo's death in a more realistic fashion. With her almost 3,000-pound masterwork, we see Cleo dying rather than dead, wearing her royal clothes, but in a pose meant to show struggle rather than sexiness. She's in a throne chair rather than reclining slinkily. There is no snake, but instead two small heads carved into the arms of her chair, meant to represent her children a reminder that she was a mother as much as she was anything else. Her head is thrown back, pain on her face, actively dying, realistically and rather graphically for the time. Some artists, like William J. Clark, were pretty disturbed by it. The effects of death are represented with such skill as to be absolutely repellent, he said, and it is a question whether a statue of the ghastly characteristics of this one does not overstep the bounds of legitimate art. Ah, William. Her work also shows a real determination. We see Cleo making a brave and difficult choice to end her own life rather than be enslaved by the white man who defeated her. There are those who suggest this depiction of Cleopatra is a commentary on American slavery. The marble was much fanned over when it was exhibited at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876. Then it disappeared. A saloon owner bought it, then it served as a grave marker for a racetrack owner's favorite horse, and then it ended up in a salvage yard left out to the elements. Boy Scouts helpfully painted over her to cover up some of the graffiti. It's a strange and somewhat sordid trajectory to which Cleopatra, sadly, would be able to relate. We see Cleopatra's legacy take another interesting turn as people start to debate her ethnicity. We don't know for sure who her mother was. Could it be that she was black? In the 20th century, she becomes a key figure in the fight for Afrocentrism, the idea that so much of culture in the West was stolen from African lands. But let's talk about that in a minute, shall we, as we dive into Cleo's image on the silver screen. Given that she's larger than life, it's no surprise that Cleopatra popped up in movies pretty much as soon as we invented them. One of the first was an 1899 French silent film called Robbing Cleopatra's Tomb. As one of the very first horror films, its story focuses in not on Cleopatra's life, but her death. In trying to resurrect her, a man ends up chopping Cleo's mummy into pieces, then makes a woman pop out of a smoking brazier. That seems disturbingly on brand. It seems like every decade has a Cleopatra movie. In 1912, there's another silent film that, of course, focuses right in on her love life. Then there's another in 1917, starring the famous Theda Bara. Theda Bara was one of Hollywood's early it girls, the sex symbol who pioneered that whole vamp look. Cleopatra of Egypt was among the earliest of the vampires of history, if not the earliest. 
wrote the New York Times at the time of the movie's debut. And it was therefore but a matter of time until the siren Theta Bara should duly attend the transfer of that temptress to the movie screen. We can imagine her Cleopatra was very goth, set on sucking the hearts and souls out of men's bodies in her quest for power. The words that flashed up on the screen to introduce her were, The Serpent of the Nile, the Siren of the Ages, and the Eternal Feminine. Though, because of the morality codes of the time, and the fact that the movie was deemed too racy for public consumption, very little of it remains. In 1934, Cecil B. DeMille made a movie about our Cleo. When he asked his leading lady if she wanted the part, he supposedly said, How would you like to be the wickedest woman in history? In 1945, the glamorous Vivian Lee gets a turn, but none are as famous as the 1963 version written by, of course, another man. This epic film is what most of us think of when we close our eyes and envision Cleopatra, though Elizabeth Taylor and the lady herself probably had little in common. It's in many ways a great film, and I recommend you watch it. But once again, the spotlight is on Cleopatra's sexual prowess her skill at seducing two powerful men. We don't see her making political decisions, or minting coins, or dealing with grain shortages. Instead, we see her bathing in a gigantic marble tub with fancy toy sailboats. We see her arriving in Rome at the end of a long, lavish parade, riding on top of an all-gold float. We see Elizabeth Taylor change lavish costumes some 65 times. All pretty fabulous, but far from a complete picture. But the really interesting thing I think about it is that originally it was destined to be two films. Like all up, it was looking at about, you know, six hours. And there was meant to be two films, one which dealt with Caesar and Cleopatra and one that dealt with Antony and Cleopatra. But because of all the various things that happened, I mean, Elizabeth Taylor almost died, they have to shoot locations, um, you know, all the, and then of course all the drama with Burton and Taylor. All the drama with heartthrob Burton and Elizabeth was that they fell in love on set, even though they were both already married, and it caused quite a scandal, not unlike Mark Antony and Cleopatra once did. The parallels were right there for exploiting. The guy who was writing it, Joseph Mankiewicz, he is actually known for doing quite strong female films. And he originally had this vision of Cleopatra that I think is probably closer to what we would like to see these days, in that she's more of a political visionary or at least a political, you know, a real political player, not just a femme fatale. But a lot of that story got lost because when they had to cut down by so much time, they ended up focusing, of course, on the epic angle, which is the battle scenes, you know, the, the pageantry, that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, they want to play up the, the romance as well, because the, the tension and the, and the affair between Burton and Taylor was such that everybody wanted to see that on the screen. So a lot of the best stuff about Cleopatra and Antony ended up on the cutting room oh, floor. Oh, this is tragic. When it comes to looks, all of the women who played Cleopatra on screen were chosen less because they looked like her and more because of what they represented to audiences of the time. And here again, we see the question of her ethnicity rising to the surface. This is one of these big (laughs) mysteries around Cleopatra is that we're not actually sure of the full uh, swath of her parenthood. So this puts us in a position where it also leaves Cleopatra open to various kinds of reception as well. And we see this coming through yeah. from second wave feminism onwards where there's the sort of real push for like, is this a, a black Cleopatra? And do we have a, a, an Egyptian Cleopatra as opposed to a Macedonian Ptolemaic Cleopatra? To what degree yeah. is she one of the people? And, and how does that factor into the way that we might think about her today? Though we know that Cleopatra considered herself Macedonian Greek, and it's unlikely she would have had much Egyptian or Nubian blood, if any, there's this desire to claim her as a woman of color. When it came out that Angelina Jolie and Lady Gaga were being considered to star as Cleo in a new movie version of her life, the internet got pretty angry. They wanted someone like Beyonce to play her. And why not? Perhaps it doesn't matter what Cleo actually looked like or didn't, but what she represents for different generations. And this generation wants to see her step out of her Western trappings and represent the continent she actually ruled. And I think she'd be okay with it. If she was anything in life, she was always adaptable, always ready to shift into what her people needed her to be. (laughs) 
And so this is the image we're left of Cleopatra. Sultry, wanton, extravagant, too emotional, even heartless. But lately we've been rethinking Cleopatra, trying to see her world and story through her own eyes without quite so much judgment, without needing to make her into a temptress or a victimized queen. As Jen points out, we're starting to realize that we can view her and other ancient women as people who contained complex multitudes. I think that for a long time, when history was really dominated by gentlemen scholars, shall we say, we kind of saw the glamour of Cleopatra and the demonization of Cleopatra. And now what we're seeing is those things don't have to necessarily be two different strands. Cleopatra was a human being who was complicated, who made some unpopular choices and some incredibly calculated and clever choices, who loved and who lost and who lived vibrantly and vividly. So what should we remember about Cleopatra? What's been shuffled out of the spotlight that should be brought back into focus? The way I think we should remember Cleopatra is that she was an extremely intelligent woman. She was clearly a great diplomat. She was uh, somebody who was prepared to engage with Rome, but you know she knew what she had. She had an awful lot of wealth in Egypt, and she played well with that. So she, you know, she extended the the borders of Egypt. She extended Egyptian territory. She was a. Uh, she spoke multiple languages, um, and indeed, she was the first Ptolemy to learn the native language of Egypt. She was clearly interested in providing for her people and breaking new ground in in Egypt. I mean, I feel like one of the things that we miss about Cleopatra when we get wrapped up in the romance of her and Mark Antony is how long she actually ruled without Mark Antony, how well Egypt was doing at the time, and what that looked like. She was a ruling woman in an era where women were encouraged to be quiet and demure and retiring, and she also spoke nine languages and ruled the richest client kingdom in the Mediterranean world, and she did it really, really well. She's a genius. She was the last pharaoh. And yes, she is the one that respons was responsible for losing Egypt. But she, I feel like regardless of who was going to be the pharaoh at this time, Egypt was going to be lost. But she really tried. She really tried to save the land for her people. Cleopatra's mind never stopped. She was always trying to find a pragmatic way of conquering all of her problems because her brain never stopped working. She was always trying to figure out her next move. And I love that about her. I love the perseverance. I love that she just didn't give up. I would say, first of all, uh, powerful. There is something really quite incredible about what she achieves and the way that she achieves it. I think she was a political animal. But I also thought that she is timeless and seductive. Now, I don't mean that in the femme fatale version of things. I just mean there is something about her, whether we like it or not, she's not going to shake off that, that appeal by now. You know, I think she'll always, because of the way that her story was treated at the time, because of her involvement with people at the time who were obviously very significant, um, you know, and still are considered very significant, we're not going to erase that now. And I wouldn't want to take it away. Like, I don't want her to disappear um, or anything like that. So I think she is timeless and seductive in that we're going to want to keep going back to her story um, because even in spite of the lack of source material, there is something very appealing about her whole life story uh, from all different perspectives. And I don't think we're done with her yet, and I'm glad of that. To sum her up in one sentence, it would be extraordinary leader born into a challenging situation who did the best she could. This was a hugely competent woman up against great odds. In all of my guest responses, the same three words came up in different forms. Here they are, summed up by Dr. Evans. Independent, intelligent, inspiring. Cleopatra was a complex leader who had to make many difficult choices, who loved and lost on an epic scale. To my mind, her physical appearance and her sexual conquests are intriguing, but they aren't the things I want to remember about her. When I imagine Cleopatra, I see her with a book in one hand and a child's hand in the other, dressed to kill and with success on her mind. I see a woman who fought hard and bravely for her country, a ruler who refused to bow down. Until next time.
Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. I've just posted an exclusive bonus over on my Patreon featuring the full interviews with my lovely guests from this episode, and you'll find many more bonus materials besides. You can also make a one-time donation there, or tell your friends about the show, leave a review wherever you listen, or buy some lady-centric art at my Explores Etsy shop. You'll find some fetching art prints and greeting cards featuring our girl Cleo, as well as posters featuring a map and timeline of ancient Egypt. For a transcript of this episode, a list of my research sources, images, credits, and more, check out the show notes over at my website, theexploresspodcast.com. A special thanks to author Stacey Schiff, whose illuminating and immersive biography of Cleo really helped me tell her story, and which I recommend if you want to learn more about her life. And to What's Her Name Podcast, who introduced me to the fabulous Edmonia Lewis. Make sure to check out their fascinating episode all about her life. Much love to Mr. Explores for my theme music logo and for his help producing this episode. <laughs>